welcome to the Boundless Psyche Timeless Soul Summit, where we're exploring the importance of bringing a spiritual perspective to our individual and collective healing work. Our hope is that you will emerge from this gathering with a deeper understanding and reverence for some of our processes of inner knowing, all or most of which are ancient, and that you will feel more tapped into that sense of connectedness that is so essential for our well-being. I am your host, Dr. Stacy Dicker, and today I am so excited to present Dr. Halane Wabe. Hi, Halane. Hi, Stacy. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Such an honor that you're here. We're so grateful that you're here. Uh, Halane Wabe, ND, MCR, is the Director of Research at the Institute of Noetic Sciences and an adjunct adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Wabe is clinically trained as a naturopathic physician and research trained with a Master of Clinical Research and two postdoctoral research fellowships. She has published on and spoken internationally about her studies on complementary and alternative medicine, mind-body medicine, extended human capacities, stress, post-traumatic stress disorder, and their relationships to physiology, health, and healing. Dr. Wabe is especially known for her research around and noetic approach to channeling. So today our topic is the science of channel. So Halane, like Jung, like Carl Jung, you grew up learning about channeling. What was that like? It was really amazing to be in a family that held that we were more than our physical bodies, that we, that there were spirits that we could connect to, that we had guides, that the body had its own innate ability to heal itself, that we had these intuitive capacities. As a very young child, I was really sensitive to things beyond the physical and when I was 10 years old, my mother actually took me to a meeting at my grandparents' house, which many of you might call a seance, where my grandmother was trans-channeling, my uncle was trans-channeling. And so essentially this trans-channeling phenomenon is the trans channel believes that they're actually um, channeling a non physical being and that that being is communicating through them. So imagine this meeting with like 30 people in the room with my, you know, uncle speaking in this weird voice. So that was kind of my introduction as a young child into a spiritualist like tradition. And those beliefs that we are not just our physical body, that there's this whole other realm really influenced my worldview and impacted me so profoundly. And yet growing up, I didn't really talk about it with people. It was something that I shared within my family and maybe a few friends that I really trusted, but it was a very private part of myself. I went to Catholic school. I went to Orthodox Christian church on Sundays. And then there was this whole very rich and deep spiritualist background as well. So in a nutshell, it was amazing growing up with channeling in my life. So great. Just like Jung, it became a central central thing. Those seeds grew into central passions and, and um, interests. And yeah, Jung also, um, you may already know this, but he had a, a psychic cousin um, named Helene Priestwork. And he also attended seances. They would be, I think, at his house. And one time... Um, a table wooden table broken half wow i didn't know that that's a great story so i mean i think these things are clearly and you know you're talking to someone i'm sure i'm in good company with this that i don't think any of this is any accident i think these things right. that we're exposed to um they're meant to to start us you know thinking and, and learning and, and diving more into those realms so yes so thank yes. you you did <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> So why did you write The Science of Channeling? And what do you hope people will gain from reading this? So as I mentioned, you know, this I had this really incredibly rich background, but it really was sidelined, you know, like I didn't really talk about it with many people. And 
you know, you heard my bio. I have a very kind of um, academic background, clinical training, even though naturopathic medicine is a little more, more fringe than regular medicine. But um, I, for the most part, I was in academia working at Oregon Health and Science University doing meditation research with combat veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder, really delving into meditation and mindfulness and how it supports healing. So I was very immersed in mainstream. I was invited to go to the Institute of Noetic Sciences for a meeting called the Future of Meditation uh, Research, which was really asking why in our Western medical uh, research paradigm, are we just studying meditation in this very prescribed way? When it's so deeply spiritual, people have all these transcendent experiences. So it was a wonderful work group with these incredible meditation researchers from around the world. And I had heard of IONS before, but I didn't really quite know about it. And I was just completely amazed by their courage to ask these esoteric research questions and do this research that I didn't see anybody else doing and that I was personally afraid to do in academia. And I felt so inspired. I was like, this is where I need to be. So that really opened up this huge pathway for me to come to IONS where I had more permission to look at channeling from a research perspective, because I never even imagined that anybody had been studying channeling. And then I realized that there was like 150 years of research that had been done on channeling and mediumship and all these intuitive capacities that I had no clue about. So being immersed in the IONS culture and the research, et cetera, was so incredibly inspiring. And I was excited to build on the work that IONS and others had done to develop a research program on channeling, where we asked very specific what I thought were important research questions that hadn't quite been answered yet. So I started talking about that in public and we were at this big donor event uh, with donors and members and um, people interested in ions. And I had this lovely conversation with a man who said, you know, you should really write a book about this channeling stuff you're talking about. I said, ha ha, you know, that's, that's really funny. <laughs> I said, you know, I don't know how I would do that or what publisher would do that. And he said, well, I actually own a publishing company and I would love to write this, have you write this book. So that just really opened this huge door. And for me, the, the highest motivator to writing this book is so that people could hold it up and say, look, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Other people have these experiences. And not only that, there is this huge wealth of information and research supporting it as a phenomenon. And sure, we don't know everything yet. We haven't definitively proven all the aspects of it. And yet, um, let's take away the taboo and start talking about it. Start having conversations about what we know, what we don't know, and how we can use these intuitive capacities to support us in our daily life. So I think that's kind of the crux of it. And just to share one more anecdote around that before I met with the publisher, um, you know, I would start talking about this and this is when we were still in person and I would have lines of people to talk to me after my presentation and they'd come really close and they'd whisper you know, thank you so much. I've had this experience, but I couldn't tell anyone about it. Like those phrases were just repeated over and over again. And everybody in that line would say the same thing, whether it was a professor, tenured professor, or, you know, someone who um, wasn't in academia, diverse range of people who were like, I've had this experience, but I can't talk about it. So it really was inspiring to be able to offer people kind of a shred of hope and something to hold on to. And that's also why we did it in um, for the general public and lay very accessible language so that anybody could really understand the breadth of the research that has been done around channeling experiences. 
it is so accessible, which is incredible because it's such an esoteric topic in certain ways, but to make it so accessible is no small feat. And I mean, it really is. It's it it succeeded, in my opinion, in doing exactly what you said. It gives legitimacy and it gives um, a sense of you're not alone. Um, by the way, Jung said that same thing. He was talking about astrology when he said it. But he said people, um, in in you know, in talking about it, people won't admit to being interested in it. But behind closed doors, it's a whole other matter. And so yes, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Experience. Um. Uh, the other thing I will say about your book, and we're going to talk a lot more about it, but um, it also, it was so helpful in terms of, um, you know, I'm someone who's been paying attention to this stuff for a long time, and it helped concretize things. It helped, I mean, you do so much research on talking to people who have all these different types of knowledge getting, and and um, it's just, it's, it's for and from people just starting out knowing nothing about it all the way to people who are really experienced and and just want to learn more about it and learn you know more fine tuning in the methods i there was an in huge immense amount of information in there that was so and still so accessible like you said so great job thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't easy to pull it all together but i feel really happy with the way it turned out. So thank you. I appreciate that feedback. Absolutely. Um, and one thing, well, two things that you said um, in your answer that I want to just highlight. Um, one of them it was so poignant when you were talking about having worked with PTSD, veterans with PTSD, and you said, yes. this is sort of a side note, but not really. You, you could tell that so many of the spirits that were around these veterans with PTSD were trying to offer them messages of forgiveness. Yes. Yes. It's so true. Yes. You know, the, the suffering, the pain and suffering that these people hold from, you know, whatever acts that they've committed in this specific case with the soldiers, a lot of Vietnam vets, um, I worked with and the guilt and the shame and, you know, just not able to let go and, and forgive themselves. And, um, you know, I was able with my abilities to see these non-physical beings just around them and not haunting in a, you know, negative way, but just really offering love and forgiveness and wanting them to let them go, really. Um, and of course, you know, every case is different, but it was really quite profound. I felt that profoundness too and thought probably there are so many of us that have other versions of that same kind of stuff that you know where we're holding on to something and and that our loved ones or our ancestors or our, the, the people that we knew who have passed would be saying it's okay it's okay you know yeah you human and, and so I just that I really that really stood out to me as an important message yeah. I've worked with a, a spiritual teacher for over 20 years now, uh, Coralite, Leslie Temple Thurston and Brad Laughlin. And, you know, there's this whole um, keys that really help us unlock our energetic system, our chakras. And so the key to really opening the heart chakra is forgiveness um, forgiving all betrayals. And so in my own personal work and, um, and in just seeing healing in general, like it's such a important piece of transformation, not only to forgive ourselves, but to forgive other people. Because if you think about this idea that we're all interconnected or we're all one, then who is there really to forgive because we're all aspects of each other in some way. And one uh, misconception that people have about forgiveness is that it makes the bad behavior. Okay. But that's the furthest thing from the truth. You can still stand for justice and stand in your power and say no to unacceptable behavior and still be in a state of love and forgiveness. You can love the tyrant and say, no, that is unacceptable. Um, anyway, we could spend many hours talking about this 
one topic, but yes, absolutely. Forgiveness is just such a powerful healing, um, healing piece. To your point, this is the last thing I'll say about it. We'll move on to another question, but I heard Brene Brown say one time that um, the research shows that the people who have the most compassion have boundaries of steel. Yes. That's so, it's so, so exactly wonderful. What you're yes. About. And we can, I, cause I think so much of the time we don't open our hearts when we fear that we will lose our, our, you know, clarity about yeah. what's right and wrong and our, our, you know, like communicating to the universe, what we think. And, and it's, you're exactly right. That there are two separate things as a, yes. as a psychologist. I definitely can attest to how much of our suffering is bound up in our inability to forgive other people and ourselves yeah hard hard work mm -hmm. um the other thing that you mentioned when you were talking about the research that and we'll get more into the taboos in a little while but when you were saying the research actually goes back 150 years and yet as you point out in your book between 1882 and present time the amount of funding that's been spent on this type of research is equivalent to two months two months of like normal psychological research. Yeah, yeah. it's really sad. <laughs> I think that's changing. I really do think that's changing. And so, you know, you mentioned the taboos. Um, there's multiple reasons why I think there are taboos for these experiences. I mean, one, there's historical precedent of people being burned at the stake for expressing them, right? Number two, so there's, I think there's like this just, you know, human trauma, like just memory trauma of, okay, it's not safe for me to actually be out about having these experiences. Number two, our current paradigm, scientific paradigm is materialistic, which basically says all these things we're talking about just are impossible and don't exist. So there's often a dissonance. And this is, of course, in the West. Because there's many places in the world where it's like, of course, there's spirits. Of course, we have intuition. Of course, we have these things. So this is a very kind of Western problem, if you will, these taboos. Um, and then so the third piece, I think, is fear. Um, I think people are afraid what it mean, what would it would mean if we actually allowed ourselves to develop these innate capacity. Oh, are you gonna read my mind? Oh, are you gonna be able to like push my car off the freeway with road rage? And so, you know, we see these exhibited in Marvel movies in Hollywood, you know, with the laser beams shooting out of the eyes and creating all this crazy destruction or the villain that has these powers and uses them in nefarious ways. So I think there is this anxiety and fear of people um, seeing them actually fully expressed. So anyway, those are three, I think of the top reasons why the taboo still exists, but I will say, you know, I first started meditation research in 2008 and it was like, you know, hitting my head against a cement wall. Right. And then I don't know how many years later we see mindfulness meditation on the cover of Time magazine. And when I left OHSU in 2015, it was all the rave, you know, CEOs at Google were doing mindfulness. I mean, it's really just shifted so quickly and I see the same thing happening with these phenomenon. I feel like things are really, really breaking open. And, you know, when we connect again in five years, we're going to be like, wow, can you, uh, you know, we wouldn't have even imagined how incredible things have shifted from when we were to where we are now. So I really do see that shift happening in a, in a very real way. And the post-materialist paradigm is birthing and we're kind of straddling the two right now and materialism is really wonderful at explaining very specific things but it's becoming exceptionally clear that it just really can't explain everything and many different scientific domains are realizing that 
it's one of the things that I'm so grateful to you for and, you know, the other people like you who are doing this kind of work, because I think it wouldn't be shifting if people were not working so hard to cross their T's and dot their I's and play by the rules of the, the you know, mm-hmm. the game that's in town. And, and, um, and it's, I, it's really incredible. And I'm so heartened by your optimism because you are so intuitive. I mean, people, if they haven't read your book, they're going to be so shocked by all of the stories. It's incredible. I guess when you've had training from when you were young and you came from a line of, of really intuitive people, you, but so like, for instance, I have a, a crystal here that I, I hold a lot of the time during the interviews with my pendulum actually. And I read it in your book that you could, you can tell when you hold a crystal, you get information about all, every place it's been back to the point of when it was carved. That's incredible. <laughs> so when you say you think things are changing, I think it means a lot more than if just, you know, somebody was saying that without all the deep, deep information and backstory that you hold, both, you know, in the literal, the you know, you are in that world in a very important way, but also your, everything else you're picking up um thank you thank you stacy i think it's also not just me i mean i i as you read my in my book i put forth that we all have this innate capacity right and that one really fascinating aspect of studying this work is to see the importance of visualization and intention that our intention matters and that it can actually affect the physical world. And we see this in healing studies. We see it in studies like mind over matter studies with probabilistic systems. We see it in multiple different avenues. And this idea that we can intend or visualize what we want to see makes a difference. And so part of me saying in five years, we're going to connect again and we'll have this is me setting the intention for that to be so. And I'm implanting that in all of your audience members so we can also collectively hold that vision that these taboos, they're just gonna easily dissolve and it's just gonna be a whole new world when we're able to have transparent conversations about our full capacities as humans. Oh, that's incredible. Hold on. I, just, I love that you just put it out there to everyone watching too. That's so powerful. Um, one thing you made me think of that is such good news. Um, I interviewed Roland McCready recently, Dr. Roland McCready, and he said something that I, I have told numerous people because it was another piece of really, um, you know, heartening and just real food for thought. He said that um, his take is that, um, but he knows it to be true, and I don't doubt it for a second, that he said if um, it's not until our vibration is high enough that we can access the truly creative, um, like there's a realm of creativity that we can't, if our vibration is not high enough, we can't access it. And I think it's such a, you talk in the book about people's fear around like, what could we do with this, this um, you know, capacity, but that that was a really helpful thing to hear that it's really the positive stuff that has more reach. Um, even if the negative can, you know, it can get quite a foothold, we know, but not yeah. with creativity, apparently it's with, you know, mob mentality and aggression and force, but um, it's just really beautiful. What you're saying is it's such a great reminder of how we co-create yes. our, our reality. Actually, one of um, you talk about the, um, I think it's the decision augmentation theory yes. in the book. I, I have a dear, dear friend that I've had for 30 plus years who channels. This, that was actually some of my earliest introduction to it. Um, and she calls them option boards. She says we have option boards. Can you picture what she means? Like you choose and yes. then it shifts and you yes. choose again and it shifts and it's just yes. so creative. Oh, oh, I got the chills on that. I know you're chill. <laughs> you wrote about it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, People always ask me, well, what do you think about this? You know, some people say, oh, the future is set in stone. And, it, you know, when you're predicting the future, you're seeing something that's definitely going to happen or whatever. I don't really resonate with that. I mean, to me, it feels like more of probabilities, which kind of resonates with what your friend was saying about the option boards. It's like there's 
there's perhaps higher probabilities that certain things are going to happen. And then when you go down that road, then though, then your options from there shift and then there's probabilities from there. And so what's being revealed to you is perhaps one highly probable outcome, but you even getting that information changes your behavior, which then shifts things. So, you know, you see this a lot with people who go to psychics or mediums and they say, you know, what am I going to be doing or what should I do here? And, you know, it's like, okay, in five years, you're going to be writing a book. They get that information. Their whole world changes. They change every all their decision making based on that piece of information. So then, five years from now, they might say, "Oh, it didn't happen," or "Oh, it happened like this." That person must have been wrong. It's like no, they just gave you, you know, a high probability outcome from where you were at in that exact moment. And so, anyway, it's an interesting dilemma of trying to study this type of stuff because I do feel it's fluid. I don't think it's set in stone. And so we're always kind of working with probabilities and our intentions and our choices in each moment. That's wonderful. This is, this is a great segue, I think, into um, talking about astrology because astrology is a, another one of those things that has, there's um, the signs are archetypes and there is a range of expression for all the signs, depending on us, depending on the work we do, you know, we inherit the archetypes, but we, we it's not set in stone. It's, it's um, dependent on it. We co-create. Um, so can you say a little bit about whether I I've asked a few of my speakers already and not one person so far. It's, I mean, not to, not to know, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about anyone, but I'm wondering if, if I can find a, a friendly home with some belief in astrology in you. <laughs> yes. So I personally believe that we are all interconnected, not just humans, but everything. And so if you take that to the extreme and that we all affect each other, why wouldn't my connection to the planetary bodies affect me in some way? And so that's kind of like at a basic level why I think astrology may be something, right? And, you know, I rebel a little bit against this. Oh, you're, this is your sun sign, so you have to act like this. So I don't think it's necessarily about putting people into boxes. And when you really go more deeply into the study of various astrological systems, you see that it's incredibly nuanced and it is not about putting people into boxes. I also find it incredibly fascinating that there are so many cultures around the world who talk about the importance of these relationships. And so the Western astrological system is just one, um, but that there's so many different ways to look at our relationship to the larger universe. So on that level, I'd say I'm a, I'm a believer that it makes a difference. Now, once you start learning more about it, it's incredibly complex and there's so many pieces at play. Um, we did one study at my um, naturopathic school that looked, asked people, you know, what's your Western astrology sign? What's your Chinese medicine? What's your Vedic, uh, astrology personality indices, Myers-Briggs, like they did this whole, you know, huge survey to look at the relationships between them. And I don't know if anyone's ever done a study like that since then, but that would be really fun to look at. And I know in my personal life, you know, I, my, my sleep is very much affected by the full moon. I know that if it's a full moon, I'm going to have three to four nights of poor sleep. And if Mercury's in retrograde, that my computer's not going to work. <laughs> it's just kind of my personal observations. And maybe I'm creating it because I know, but there've been times when I didn't know it was a full moon or it was Mercury retrograde. And I'd have those experience and be like, Oh, okay. Mercury's in retrograde. That's why my computer's not working. Anyway, just small little pieces there. Yay. 
Thank you, Helene. I, I had a feeling that you might be able to to validate it too. I mean, it's I if you are sensitive, you can feel stuff like that, like you're saying, and and um, that sounds like a fascinating study. I was going to say to you, tongue in cheek, that if Ions ever wants to do any astrological research. I have a background in doing research from okay. uh, clinical psychology background. So I just, I mean, cause I, I do think that there's stuff to, to find. It's not, you know, yeah. I don't want to be, um, we have to be careful, right. When we do research on this kind of stuff that we're not taking our Western, like I'm going to capture it. I'm right. going to learn all about it. It's a, it's a relationship and it's, we've got to yes. be humble and we've got to be, we've got to understand our place in the universe. If, if, we're going to be trying to have these kinds of conversations with other yes. aspects of it. Yes. Thank you for your offer. You know, we get emails from people, um, I'd say regularly wanting to us to do astrology research. And, you know, that's probably the hardest part of my job is trying to discern and manage all of our millions of incredible project ideas, because we really are a small team and we have limited time and energy and resources. Um, so we have to kind of pick and choose. So an astrology project is not at the top of the list yet, but if we had, you know, some incredible funding come in who said, Hey, we want you to do this. And we'd be like, that's so exciting. So um, yes, we're looking forward to um, being able to, expand our research work and be able to do more and more projects as our team grows and funding increases. That's great to hear. And I, it really was tongue in cheek that, yeah. you know, but, but I, you're not the only one. Yes. I love that. I love hearing that because it's, you know, I, it's, it's just validating. Yeah. And, you know, when, when we see things that are there, you know, yes. They're there. They're they're just because we don't understand them doesn't mean that we can't learn more about them. Yeah. And to take it one step further, because I think we can go a little bit on the edge here. So when you um, get information from channelers, they will often say that before we embody on the earth, that we actually choose the lessons that we want to have and that we choose for the most part, when we're going to be born, of course, now we have C-sections on all this funny stuff, but that, um, I don't want to say C-sections are funny. Sorry. I didn't mean to phrase it like that, but, um, when we make those choices, it actually gets reflected in our chart because there are themes associated to, as you know, the different planets, et cetera, that line up with the life lessons that we want to experience in that lifetime. I've heard that same thing many times and um, with the life lessons and also the, um, to, to have the resources that we need to have to, mm. to be born into the circumstances. Um, yeah. I love in your book, you talk about this too. It's, it's such a heartening finding that so many people converge on these things that you hear multiple voices saying the same information. Yes. It, it helps us have faith that these things are, are true and real. Yeah. yeah. So it's beautiful. Thank you so much, Helene. Um, one thing that you, I want to get into talking about how we put ourselves in the best position to channel um, mm -hmm. and, and I'll swing back to astrology just briefly once when we are talking about this, just because it, it, um, there's a, a beautiful synchronicity with something in your book that I just wanted to throw out there. So can you talk a little bit about how we can, um, put ourselves in the best position to be able to do this? Yes, yes, absolutely. So I mentioned already, you know, I hold the hypothesis, if you will, that all humans have the innate capacity to channel in some way, but that the expression of our channeling or intuitive capacities are unique and are very, uh, they're like a fingerprint. We call it the noetic signature. So noetic means inner wisdom from the Greek gnosis and signature, you know, represents this unique expression of our intuitive selves. And, you know, you've heard me say this word channeling um, quite frequently, and some of you may have some understanding of what 
you think that word is, but just to share what how I am using that word, it really is this very broad umbrella term that represents the wide variety of intuitive expression that people experience. And it can um, ex be experienced in a receptive way and also in an expressive way. So it really is this accessing information and energy from beyond our conventional notions of time and space. So to give you an example, a receptive uh, intuitive capacity would be, you know, I'm sitting here doing the dishes and I get this, you know, image of my mother falling, you know, and then I'm like, oh my goodness. And I fall and she's like, I just fell. So that's receptive because I'm receiving kind of information. Expressive is what I was talking about earlier, which is like mind over matter, our intention affecting the physical world. There've been numerous studies where let's say energy healers direct their positive intention to plants or cells in a Petri dish or to a human. And we can see clear changes from that directed positive intention. So that's an example of expressive. And these phenomena really exist on a wide spectrum from intuitive gut hunches that just about anybody can say they've experienced to knowing the future, which we kind of talked about a little bit, uh, telepathy or mind to mind communication. And then on the extreme end would be the trans channeling, which I first shared about and things like mental mediumship where the medium feels they're getting information about deceased humans. And so each one of your noetic signatures is unique and different and perfect in and of itself. And I really support this notion that not one is better than the other. And so how do we nurture that? Step one is acknowledging that you actually have this capacity, you know, really holding that awareness and understanding. In fact, in one of the most, the strongest predictors in all of the studies that we have done is belief, is belief that channeling is possible and that you can actually channel. So people who believe do better on experimental tasks in the lab and they have more spontaneous experiences. The next strongest predictor is meditation or some other focused attention training. And that makes sense to me because I'm a med I'm a long time meditator and I know how that has changed my um, the quality of my thoughts, my ability to stay in a no thought space and just kind of be open to the present moment. And so when you're able to when you're trained to witness your thoughts, to be aware of what's going on in your mind, I think it, it makes you more open to having those experiences and doing better on tasks. And then the third component, um, which necess hasn't necessarily been tested in the same way as beliefs and meditation, but we know that intention is so incredibly important. So if you can find it in yourself to believe in channeling, to believe you can channel, uh, begin a, if you don't already have a meditation or other type of attention training practice, even if it's just five minutes a day, and then set the intention to increase your intuitive sensitivity. Those three steps are so they sound very simple, but they're totally huge and will make an incredible impact in your life on your channeling journey. Yeah, those are great. And I also, I, you said in your book, I was heartened to see this as a therapist. And I think a lot of people listening are also going to be therapists, but um, doing personal growth work and what you call clearing egoic layers is also yes. another piece that's so important. And I, it fits so much with what we know about um, like psychedelic journeys that mm -hmm. we uh, it's our defenses that get in the way of us being able to access the 
the truth and the, the spiritual information. And so I, it was great to see that, that that's actually, um, and I, speaking personally, I mean, I meditate also, but speaking personally, I do think that that is some of the stuff that um, also helps that, you know, it clears us, it clears us of the, the stuff. I mean, some of this, I, I even, I love ancestral healing and I think our, our ancestral stuff um, can, can kind of gunk up our, um, our, ability to to access things yes yes and you know many spiritual traditions will say that you know if you sit in meditation for long enough that those egoic layers will clear and i think nowadays especially with the western mind which is so i mean we're so cut off at the neck very very mental that there have been so many tools that have come to the forefront to help us quickly process and clear so that, you know, we don't have to go into a cave and meditate for 20 years to clear the layers of our ego. There's tools that really can help us do it in a quick and efficient way. And I don't know about your experience with your clients, but I do find that clearing today is much easier than it was 10 years ago that if people set the intention and put effort towards it, they can really clear stuff so much more quickly. And I also want to just be clear that, you know, it's not about getting rid of the ego. I think we do need to have an ego to live on this planet in the physical world and, you know, cook food and, you know, get ourselves places. I, the way I think about it is that we're basically lightening the vibration, if you will, of our ego and we're expanding it. We're expanding it so it can be much bigger, more fluid, more flexible, um, so that it can contain the broader nature of who we really are instead of being driven by unconscious motivations that we picked up as kids because we're just trying to survive or we inherited from our um, ancestors, you know, being victims, or, I mean, you know, we could name all the sort of archetypical patterns that are embroiled in our ego that we can work through. And, you know, there's the old joke, oh, it's just like the layers of the onion, but that has been my experience. It is like the layers of an onion and you just, you just keep doing the work and it gets easier and easier, but it's, and your witness strengthens so you can, um, observe it more neutrally and with love and sometimes even humor. Um, and you can move that um, as you proceed on your channeling journey. And, you know, not to scare people, but there's so many stories. I Let me rephrase that. There's not so many. There are some very sad stories of exceptional um, healers or exceptional channelers who haven't done that ego clearing work. And then when they're in their human selves, they are abusive or commit violence or, you know, really bad, bad, horrible behavior. And it's, you see this dichotomy and you're like, wow, how can this person be so amazing and do these incredible healings or, you know, help people in this incredible way. And then do all this horrible stuff. And it's because they, in my opinion, the layers of the ego just weren't cleared. And so when they're in their human self, you know, all of those patterns just, you know, come into play. I completely and totally agree with you. It makes me think of, um, I heard someone say, I don't remember who it was, but they were asked a definition of <clears throat> enlightenment. How do you know if someone's enlightened? And the first thing the person said was, what are they like in their marriage? What are they <laughs> with their coworkers? You know, like that. Yeah. So, to your point, yes. Um, so, one of the things that you say in your book that, and this is the <clears throat> the beautiful synchronicity with astrology, and in, in my opinion, you talk about how balancing the divine, masculine, and feminine actually helps with this too. And so, this is one of the reasons that I love astrology because there's, you know, you've got your sun sign as your, your major masculine archetype and your, your moon sign is your major feminine archetype. There's a lot more, as you pointed out before, there's a lot more to it. Everything was somewhere, um, was yeah. born, but your sun, the sun and the moon are two really the two most fundamental and it's a great place to start. And so 
I presented at ASAP in 2022, and my topic was um, about cultivating more compassion and empathy for yourself and other people using psychological astrology. And this is exactly what this is kind of the crux of it is is using our our own particular sun and moon archetypal combination and learning about it, learning about because each of the signs is masculine or feminine. So depending on their placement, it can be kind of a a tricky um, thing to navigate. And so, but just that whole idea that that those two things, when our masculine and feminine is in balance, that that's a form of of clearing and healing. And I mean, it just made perfect sense seeing that and it just and thinking too about you talk so much i love this actually you talk about how the state of mind to be in when you're trying to channel you talk about allowing you talk about trust you talk about openness and you specifically say guys this is not where driven energy is going to help at all (laughs) so that's masculine out of balance yes kind of too much drivenness and not enough receptivity i think the feminine coming into better balance Helps yes. us. It, it makes perfect sense why that absolutely works. and you see it playing out in our our culture right now i mean there's so much exploration of gender and gender roles and our expression of gender and it i i'm perceiving this as this beautiful human exploration of what that actually means and so each one of us regardless of our um, sex at birth has masculine and feminine qualities. And I think people are better able, at least in the West to, um, kind of hold that and understand that more than ever. And how do we kind of love and embrace those aspects within ourselves? Um, it's come up a lot in our studies too, because, you know, classic research study, you always ask about age, gender, race, you know, socioeconomic status. And usually it was just male, female, right? And now we have to really think about how we ask that question. Do you say, okay, what was your uh, sex at birth? Or how do you consider yourself? Do we put it on boxes? Do we now put a spectrum? And there was a couple of really cool studies that asked about uh, gender at birth and how they identify now, but also had them rate their masculinity and femininity, which I think is a really wonderful way to go because, you know, gender can only tell you so much, right? But if we actually include kind of that femininity, masculinity, that may tell us even more because perhaps that is more related to this, how we express our intuitive gifts. And so I know we're getting ready to wrap up here, but I also want to bring this back to this whole noetic signature because we've done this whole research program about the noetic signature, including creating an inventory where you can take it and see, um, how you lie on these 12 characteristics that we observed about the noetic signature. And it's this beautiful, just tool of exploration for you to um, explore your own expression of these intuitive capacities that all of us have. That's a beautiful note to end on. And I, I'll just say before we tell people where they can find you in your work, I just want to say one of your um, one of the things that you put in the book that I thought was so amazing and and so hopeful is you said eventually we will be no longer separate from the entities that we're channeling that we will will merge with their higher vibration. So that's a really incredible thing for us to be manifesting and working toward one individual getting more in touch with their noetic signatures at a time. That's right. Can you imagine when the veil, you know, people talk about the veil between the worlds, but if that veil wasn't there, you you know, I mean, that would be totally amazing. So thank you for bringing that up. That's great. Thank you so much, Alane. So um, is there anything else that you want to share before we wrap up? I just want to leave people with a note of hope and inspiration and just invite you to explore explore your own 
noetic signature, your own capacities. And we have so many resources on the IONS website at noetic.org. We have all of our publications, our projects. You can participate in our research study. We have an online conference coming up at the beginning of June where you can learn more about what we're doing and just stay connected, join our community. There's just a wealth of information to support you on your path. Thank you so, so very, 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 very much, Dr. Halane Wabe for this beautiful, wonderful interview and your wisdom and all the work you're doing in the world. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the people who are watching and participating in the Boundless Psyche Timeless Soul Summit. Take wonderful. care, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Halane. Bye.